We started this series using logic and common sense to argue in favor of the existence of a creator, with special focus on the cosmological justification. Then we looked at nature and found compelling evidence that an intelligent designer had been involved not only in the creation of the universe, but also in the development of life on Earth. We then took a close look at Genesis to see how the Bible's creation account fits in with the observable evidence in nature. In the two studies after this one, we will shift our focus from origins to the rest of the Bible. Specifically, we'll examine the accuracy of some of the more controversial biblical stories by looking at external evidences from history, geography, archaeology, and a bit of geology. But before we do this, we should have some understanding of the history of the Bible itself. We'll talk first about canonization, or how we came to recognize the books of the Bible as the Word of God, and then briefly look at the manuscript evidence that attests to the accuracy of current copies of Scripture. As Christians, we believe the Bible to be the inspired and trustworthy Word of God. If it weren't, it would not carry the weight necessary to be the basis for our faith. But how do we know that the books in our Bible are inspired? What sets them apart from the many other writings of Jewish and Christian antiquity, including other Gospels? This brings us to the subject of the Biblical Canon. Canon means rod or standard, and in this context refers to the set of books that Christian scholars recognize as inspired and thus worthy of inclusion in the Bible. Most Christian churches agree on the majority of the canon, although the Catholic Church has some additional books referred to as the Apocrypha that are not found in the Protestant Bible. In the first part of this study, we'll explore the method by which scholars have recognized inspired scripture and why there has been some disagreement. The first thing to keep in mind is that the canon wasn't determined by some church council. Rather, congregations from throughout Christendom independently recognized which books met the criteria that attested to their divine quality. The Bible is not merely a book written and compiled by a bunch of people. It is a collection of inspired messages given and preserved by God throughout history. Dr. Eckhard Schnabel, professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, wrote an excellent article titled, History, Theology, and the Biblical Canon, an Introduction to Basic Issues. In it, he fairly and thoroughly addresses many of the issues relating to the process of canonization. Much of the first part of this study will come from this article, and I encourage you to read it yourself if you desire greater detail. The topic of the Biblical Canon is of paramount importance to the Christian faith. It has the potential to fundamentally affect not only what we believe, but how we live and even how we spend eternity. Yet because God didn't just hand us a big book of scripture, but rather worked through people throughout history to communicate his message, it's hard to know exactly which writings make the cut. The concept of a recognized canon of divine revelation goes back to the Pentateuch, or Law, of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 4.2 establishes its authority over the Israelites by forbidding anyone from adding to or taking away from the commands of God. And clearly, the Jewish nation understood the laws of God to be divinely inspired since they preserved and recognized them for so long. The history behind the canonization of the prophetic books is harder to establish, but most scholars believe it to have been closed and settled upon in the 5th century BC and certainly by the beginning of the 2nd century BC. Finally, the writings portion of the Old Testament may have become established canon as a result of decisions made by rabbis at the Council of Jamnia. Many Hebrew scholars accept this as the point at which the Old Testament canon was finally established, though it's hard to be sure since we know very little about this council, and some debates over canonicity did continue after this time. While we don't know exactly how the Old Testament books became recognized as canonical, it is clear that an established set of Jewish texts existed prior to Jesus' time. Jesus quotes from 24 Old Testament books, implying that both he and his audience were familiar with their status as authoritative. Additionally, it is clear that at the time of Jesus, the books of the Old Testament had already been sorted into collections, the Torah, Law, Nevim, Prophets, and Kethubim, writings. In Luke 24:44, Jesus says, quote, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. 
Jewish historian Josephus also cites the Old Testament canon as being made up of these three collections. So if Jesus and other New Testament writers recognized the books of the Old Testament as authoritative, that makes a pretty solid case that they should be included in the Bible. There are five Old Testament books which are not quoted in the New Testament, but they have been passed down as part of the aforementioned collections, and their canonicity is thus well established. Before we move on to the New Testament canon, we need to address the Old Testament Apocrypha. The Apocrypha refers to a set of books which are not found in the Hebrew canon that we just discussed, but which do appear in the Greek version of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint. These books are largely of historical rather than spiritual significance, and are not quoted in the New Testament. But since the Septuagint was used as the basis for some Latin translations of the Bible, these books were mistakenly accepted as canonical by many early Christians. The monumental 4th century Latin Vulgate translation by Jerome also included the Apocrypha, but Jerome prefaced them by pointing out that they were not at the same level as the other books. Unfortunately, later copies of this Bible often omitted these prefaces, leading to their widespread acceptance among Christians as authoritative. The Old Testament apocryphal books are not bad or heretical works, but their acceptance by some as authoritative is a historical mistake. Not only were they never referenced by Jesus or the Apostles, they also seem to sometimes take liberties with both fact and theology. The modern Catholic Bible still includes them, perhaps out of tradition as much as anything, but Protestants have justifiably left them out so as to preserve the Bible's authoritative quality. The very early Christian church did not have a New Testament as we do, but rather had a collection of writings from various church leaders, including the Apostles. Churches in different regions often had preferences for certain Christian writings over others, but the writings we have in the modern New Testament were generally held above the rest. In particular, the four Gospels, the Pauline Epistles, as well as Acts, 1 Peter, and 1 John, had become widely and independently accepted by many churches by the end of the second century, possibly even earlier. The canonicity of Revelation endured a period of challenges over its authorship and theology, but was finally accepted by the end of the fourth century. The disputed books, James, Jude, 2nd and 3rd John, 2nd Peter, and Hebrews, were accepted by some churches, but doubted by others. In 367 AD, Bishop Athanasius compiled a formal list of books that he considered canonical. His list contained the Old Testament without the Apocrypha, as well as the 27 books of the modern New Testament. This canon had achieved widespread acceptance by the end of the 6th century, and this acceptance continues among mainstream Christian churches today. Although this Athanasian canon was new in the sense that it was a comprehensive list of authoritative Christian books, we need to remember that it wasn't Athanasius who dictated for the church which books were canonical. Rather, the church as a whole had long ago recognized these books as authoritative. He just put them together in a formal list. As for his inclusion of those six disputed books mentioned earlier, they had already been accepted by many churches, if not the majority. And although questions over their canonicity have been raised since, the church as a whole generally agrees that their inclusion in the canon is warranted. This quick summary gives us a basic understanding of how the New Testament canon achieved acceptance, but we also need to know what led early Christians to see these books as authoritative, and why others were rejected. Probably the most important factor was whether the author was an apostle. The books in our New Testament canon are believed to have either been written by an apostle of Christ, that is, someone who had first-hand experience with him, or by one of their close associates. Of course, several New Testament authors are not clearly identified, and thus, debate over authorship causes some uncertainty over whether these books meet the criteria just mentioned. However, the wholehearted acceptance and distribution of these letters by their recipients implies that they understood who had written them, and knew them to be reliable. Another requirement is that the books abide by the rule of faith, or the rule of truth. That is, that they be useful and sound in their teaching and not contradict other established scriptures. There has been some debate over certain books meeting this criteria, perhaps most notably by Martin Luther's questioning of James' doctrinal quality.
However, these books enjoyed early acceptance and although they may sometimes present challenging teachings, they do not directly contradict one another, but rather have a complementary theological relationship. Those books which have been rejected from the canon were either written too late to be apostolic in origin or contained theology that directly contradicted that of established scripture. Additionally, none of them ever enjoyed the widespread acceptance in the early church that the canonical scriptures did. One such book is the Gospel of Thomas, which doesn't seem to ever have been widely recognized and which attributes statements to Jesus that contradict his other teachings. There's one last point I want to make before concluding this look at canonization. The fact that we believe scriptures to be the word of God means that he has undoubtedly been involved in their preservation, acceptance, and distribution all along. Thus, it is reasonable to conclude that the modern canon's widespread acceptance is not an accident or a purely human accomplishment, but is the result of God's guidance throughout history. Christianity advocates faith and trust in God. Although facts and history are important tools in discerning the truth, it is not wrong to trust that God has been active in preserving his word for us. Schnabel concludes his biblical canon article as follows, quote, The lack of precise answers for many specific questions, the undeniable human element in the history of the canon, and the time factor in the process of canonization all show the human side of the Bible. The canon of scripture is not a book which fell from heaven. The canonical process and our knowledge of it reflect the very nature of Scripture. As Scripture is both a human record of Israel's and the Apostles' experience in history, and the divinely inspired revelation of God's will, so the canon of Scripture is the outcome of human appreciation and evaluation of foundational documents, and at the same time, the result of God's sovereign will. Lee Strobel devotes a chapter of his book, The Case for Christ, to the topic of documentary evidence for the New Testament. Since there are no surviving original documents from the New Testament, everything we have to go on is a copy. Given this, how can we be sure that the copies we have today have not been somehow altered, whether intentionally or not, during the process of copying? Strobel interviews Dr. Bruce Metzger, a renowned expert on the topic of New Testament texts and a graduate of Princeton University. Metzger points out a number of facts that go a long way in establishing the New Testament's documentary credibility. One is the quantity of copies from different geographical areas. The first six books of second century Roman historian Tacitus's Annals of Imperial Rome exist today in only one copy, dating from around 850 AD. We have just nine Greek manuscripts of first century Jewish historian Josephus's The Jewish War, all copied after the 9th century, while a single Latin copy exists from the 4th century. In stark contrast, more than 5,000 Greek manuscripts of New Testament books have been found, more than any other ancient book. The only one that comes close is Homer's Iliad, of which less than 650 Greek manuscripts have been found, all from nearly a millennium after it was written. The sheer quantity of copies of New Testament books from all over the world which agree with one another says a lot about how close to the original they are. Metzger points out that, quote, the only way they'd agree would be where they went back genealogically in a family tree that represents the descent of the manuscripts. Another important factor is the age of the oldest copies. Metzger explains that the Chester Beatty Biblical Papyri Collection contains portions of the four Gospels, Acts, the eight letters of Paul, Hebrews, and Revelation, all dating from the 3rd century AD. There have also been other papyrus discoveries dating from this time period, which also contain portions of the Gospels. The oldest surviving New Testament manuscript is a small fragment of the Gospel of John, and has been dated to the early 2nd century. Strobel and Metzger point out how this discovery forced many biblical skeptics to abandon their belief that the Gospel of John had not even been written until after 160 AD. Finally, there's the quantity of translations and early quotations. Metzger explains that, quote, In addition to Greek manuscripts, we also have translations of the Gospels into Latin, Syriac, and Coptic at a relatively early time, and many others, roughly 24,000, appear a short time later. By piecing together the information from these translations from a relatively early date, 
we could actually reproduce the contents of the New Testament. In addition to that, even if we lost all the Greek manuscripts and the early translations, we could still reproduce the contents of the New Testament from the multiplicity of quotations in commentaries, sermons, letters, and so forth by the early church fathers. This wealth of evidence has led scholars the world over to conclude as did Sir Frederick Kenyon, former director of the British Museum, quote, the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. Metzger and Strobel discuss one other important topic in this chapter, the significance of discrepancies in the various copies. Although there are thousands of variants between the New Testament manuscripts, many of these are grammatical or spelling differences which have no effect on the meaning of the passage. And where some manuscripts contain small portions that are not found in others, the omission of these has no effect on Christian doctrine, since there are other established passages which repeat it. According to Metzger, quote, The more significant variations do not overthrow any doctrine of the church. Any good Bible will have notes that will alert the reader to variant readings of any consequence, but again, these are rare. Well, this wraps up our discussion of the literary history of the Bible. Hopefully this has helped you understand some of the reasons why modern copies of the Bible are both trustworthy and remarkably accurate.